Good morning. Good morning and welcome. This is Mr. B's Sunday School. I am Mr. B, and today we are here to consider the nature and the character of peace. First thing we like to do in this class, though, is pray. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us about peace from your holy word. And we can get to know you and to understand the nature of peace. And that we can get to know you uh, in Jesus, your son Jesus, who is in the character of peace. Help us to see how these things work out today in your word. Pray that you bless the reading of your word for each of us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, maybe you've heard people say things like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Or, he's just a chip off the old block. Or, see if you can finish this sentence for me. Like father, like son, right? The likeness, the character, and the nature of a son is very similar to his father on this earth, though we maybe don't give it as much thought or as much emphasis as the old timers did. Jesus made a big deal out of the father and son similarities. When he spoke to his enemies, the self-righteous and wealthy, the religious and politically elite of his day. Let's take a look. Gospel of John, chapter 8, starting at verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love and recognize me. For I came from God out of his very presence and have arrived here. For I have not even come on my own initiative as self-appointed, but he is the one who sent me. Why do you misunderstand what I am saying? It is because your spiritual ears are deaf and you are unable to hear the truth of my word. You are of your father the devil and it is, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. Okay. Now, we know from our earlier studies that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus encouraged those around him to look at how he lived, what he was like, his character, and his nature as evidence that he is God the Son, sent by God the Father. Got a reading for you from Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And suddenly 
there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Okay. The holy angel proclaims the glory of God and the very character and nature of God, who, as a person, was sent to live among us and to show us what God is like. God sent his Son to make peace with all those who God has chosen to be his sons. And we who have accepted Jesus as God are called to reflect, to be like our Father who is in heaven. So, how does that work, you might say? How is it that we should reflect the nature and the character of God? Well, one way is to be a peacemaker, a maker of peace. And we cannot bring or make something we are not and do not have. Let's find out a little bit more, this time from Isaiah. We're at Isaiah chapter 9, starting at verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace, of the increase of his government, and of peace. There will be no end. Now we notice here that this passage is not using the Trinitarian title Father for the Messiah. Rather, it is portraying him as a king. The Messiah is the king the Prince of Peace. He is the ruler whose reign will bring about peace because the nations will rely on his just decisions in their disputes. This kind of king contrasts with even the best of the Davidic line, that Judah has experienced so far, because these titles show that this king, the Messiah, will be divine. Okay. Got a reading for you from Matthew. We're going to look at the Amplified. We're at Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the makers and the maintainers of peace, for they will express his character and be called the sons of God. Okay, we got a little note here for you. The Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, here, the one we were, we have been working through the Beatitudes these last few weeks. In the Beatitudes, Christ succinctly describes the basic character traits of those who will inherit the kingdom. The word kingdom usually implies someone who is on top, who rules and has authority over others. They are the privileged. In God's kingdom, however, the people are not privileged because they're on top. 
but because by being on the bottom, they are in a better position to receive God's grace and favor. These characteristics are the reverse of what men generally, or what mankind generally values in the world. Blessed can also be translated as happy. The signs of being blessed aren't power or material wealth. The sign of being blessed is receiving the benefits of God's grace. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes we in our humanity are tired of all the conflict around us. What does the Bible say? Take a look at Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, starting at verse 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for only a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems sad and painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, right standing with God, and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. So then, strengthen hands that are weak, and knees that are feeble. Cut through and make smooth straight paths for your feet that are safe and go in the right direction so that the leg which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather may be healed. Continually pursue peace with everyone, and the sanctification without which no one will ever see the Lord. Okay, we have a definition for you now from Nelson's new illustrated Bible dictionary, and the word of the day is peace. Nelson says, Peace is a word with several different meanings in the Old and in the New Testament. The Old Testament meaning of peace was completeness, soundness, and well-being of the total person. This peace was considered God-given, obtained by following the law. Peace sometimes had a physical meaning, suggesting security, contentment, prosperity, and the absence of war. The traditional Jewish greeting, shalom, means peace and was a wish for peace. In the New Testament, peace often refers to the inner tranquility and poise of the Christian whose trust is in God through Christ. This understanding was originally expressed in the Old Testament writings about the coming Messiah. The peace that Jesus Christ spoke of was a combination of hope, trust, and quiet in the mind and soul brought about by a reconciliation with God. Such peace was proclaimed by the host of angels at Christ's birth and by Christ himself in his Sermon on the Mount. And during his ministry, he also taught 
about this kind of peace at the Lord's Supper shortly before his death. The Apostle Paul later wrote that such peace and spiritual blessedness was a direct, direct result of faith in Christ. Okay. Got a reading for you from Romans chapter 5. At verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, a little note here that says chapter 5 begins with a ringing affirmation of the objective legal standing of the Christian. That the Christian, through faith in Christ, has been justified and declared righteous by God. Once for all, the result of this is that the Christian is no longer lives under the fear of judgment and the wrath of God, but has peace with God, which is not merely a subjective feeling, but an objective reality. Okay. Got a reading for you from the Gospel of John. We're at John chapter 14, uh, verse 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Now the expression peace or shalom in the Hebrew had a much richer connotation than the English word does, since it conveyed not merely the absence of conflict and turmoil, but also the notion of positive blessing, especially in terms of a right relationship with God, and also, as a result, the idea that all is well in one's life. This may be manifested most clearly, clearly amid persecution and tribulation, which we hope to take a look at next week. In the Jewish culture, people greet one another by saying, Shalom. But what does Shalom mean? Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace, but it means so much more than that. Shalom is not just the absence of war or the absence of conflict. Shalom is a wholeness, a completeness, as well as prosperity. Do we create shalom or do we simply resolve disputes? We pray for shalom, but only God can give Shalom. Got a reading for you from Colossians. We're at Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, 
and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus will ultimately quell all rebellion against God and his purposes. For believers, this means present reconciliation. As the Prince of Peace, Jesus will ultimately quell all rebellion against God and his purposes. For believers, this means present reconciliation to God as his friends. As for non-believers and the demonic powers, Christ's universal reign of peace will be enforced on them, for their rebellion will be decisively defeated by Christ as conquering king. So that they can no longer do any harm in the universe. The basis for Christ's reign of peace is the blood of his cross. The cross truly is the pivotal point in human and cosmic history. All right. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the work you completed on the cross, bringing peace. Bless the reading of your holy word for each of us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a great week.